Hello, and welcome to TI Precision Lab on Transimpedance Amplifiers, or TIA for short. TIAs are primarily used to convert current to voltage and are frequently used in optical applications. In this series, we will introduce and discuss TIAs and how they can be useful for certain applications. We will discuss how to intuitively design and stabilize TIA circuits and how decompensated amplifiers can be used to optimize the stability of a TIA application. For this video, we will focus mainly on the basics of TIAs and defining system requirements. To fully understand the concepts, it will be helpful to watch TI Precision Lab video series covering bandwidth, stir rate, and stability of amplifiers before proceeding. To start simply, a transimpedance application boils down to converting a current to a voltage. One of the simplest methods to achieve current to voltage conversion uses only two components, a current source and a resistor. Leaving the desired output voltage to be computed using Ohm's law, V equals IR. For a given input current, increasing the load resistor will proportionally increase the output voltage, or in other words, increases the gain of the application, or referred to as the transimpedance gain. If it was this straightforward, why not always use this method for any and all transimpedance applications? Well, several unwanted issues arise when using this type of configuration. First and foremost is the inability to load the circuit with additional components without affecting both the gain and the input impedance. For example, a high gain application will require a large resistor which results in a high input impedance design. This is problematic because additional impedances might be introduced as additional inputs are added to the system, consequently leading to an unintended decrease in the gain. The load must be significantly larger in impedance to avoid this issue. With regards to the input, the current source in practice is non-ideal. In many transimpedance applications, an optical sensor, such as a photodiode, is used, which introduces an input capacitance. This leads to another issue of slowing the signal response due to a large time constant created by the resistor and the capacitor in high gain designs. A simple computation using the RC time constant for a charging capacitor, tau equal to load resistance multiplied by the diode capacitance, shows a proportional relationship between the load resistance and the time it will take to fully charge a capacitor to 5 tau. Using a transimpedance amplifier minimizes these issues. A typical TIA circuit will be configured as an inverting amplifier. The output of the amplifier will drive the inverting input to be equal to the non-inverting input. Therefore, in an ideal environment, the source essentially sees a near-zero input impedance, even though the input to the amplifier is high impedance. In this case, changing the feedback resistor or the gain will not affect the input impedance from the perspective of the source. Similarly, low output impedance is an inherent characteristic of amplifiers when used in a negative feedback configuration. This allows for additional loading to the circuit without affecting the gain. The amplifier chosen will affect the time constant depending on its specifications, such as bandwidth, selling time, and slew rate. Otherwise, this design conceptually functions in a similar manner. An input current range, typically between several picoamps to several milliamps, will flow through the feedback resistor. Due to the node at the inverting input viewing a high input impedance into the amplifier, little to no current will go through the inverting input of the amplifier. Or another way to think about it would be since both nodes are at the same potential, no current flows between them. Therefore, all the current goes through the feedback resistor, essentially converting the input current to an output voltage by again, using Ohm's law. Output voltage is equal to the photodiode current multiplied to the feedback resistor. As previously mentioned, a photodiode acts as an input current source in most optical applications, which introduces an input capacitance at the inverting input of the amplifier. This will cause instability for most amplifiers. Throughout the rest of the video series, we will discuss the most efficient manner in stabilizing the circuit by compensating the input capacitance with a feedback capacitor. Typically, transimpedance applications are featured in a wide range of optical front-end designs, such as in LiDAR, time of flight, surveying equipment, speed measurement devices, optical time domain reflectometry, and spectroscopy. 
All of these applications include a current output of a photodiode or other types of sensors that would need to be processed to a voltage signal by a TIA. In most practical situations, a list of system level performance requirements is what leads to choosing the best suited amplifier. This flowchart outlines a simple approach to determine the right TIA for your application. The first step is to gather your system inputs and requirements such as the transit impedance gain, the capacitance of your chosen photodiode, and the bandwidth of the system. Next, you will need to determine the total input capacitance to the TIA, including the photodiode's capacitance, an estimation of the amplifier's common mode and differential input capacitance, and any stray capacitance contributed by the PCB. To compensate the effects of the input capacitance, the first step is to calculate the feedback capacitor that will stabilize the TIA circuit. Next is to take the results of the previous steps and use it to determine the minimum gain bandwidth product of the amplifier. In some situations, the resultant gain bandwidth might be too large for a feasible solution, given the gain bandwidth limitations of real amplifiers. In this case, it is appropriate to instead consider other options such as decreasing the input capacitance or decreasing the system bandwidth. For other situations, the desired gain could lead to a violation of the amplifier's maximum output range in which case, the best alternative would be to consider a multi-stage solution with the same overall gain. Once an amplifier or amplifiers have been selected, it is time to simulate the circuit. In the subsequent slides, you will go into more detail of each step. Let's start with determining the trans-impedance gain or the feedback impedance of the TIA circuit. Determining the correct output range for your application before choosing an amplifier will help avoid saturating the amplifier and save time when it comes to designing your TIA circuit. We can calculate the range of RF by considering the two extremes. The first is to determine the maximum current the photodiode can provide and the maximum voltage you would want to see at the output of the amplifier. By simply using Ohm's law, divide the two variables to obtain the feedback resistance or RF. The second calculation is a bit more complicated and will require more knowledge on the amplifier parameter values as well as some trial and error calculation. We will delve into this topic further in the second portion of the TIA series, which will be on noise analysis. For now, the concept is to first compute the smallest signal that has to be measured by the system by considering the minimum current the photodiode can provide. The minimum signal that can be detected will depend on how much noise is referred back to the input, so the smaller the noise seen at the input, the smaller the signal you can resolve. Using Ohm's law, Divide the total integrated output RMS voltage noise by the minimum current that is seen at the input to obtain RF. Increasing RF, or the transimpedance gain, will help to achieve an input current close to the minimum current that the chosen photodiode can provide. It does so by lowering the total referred current noise seen at the input and as a result, lowers the integrated input RMS current noise. The next challenge arises when designing for a range that works for both the max and min input currents. You would either have to increase the minimum current or deal with the output voltage saturating at your highest input current. If you design for the smallest current, you can clamp the output, but this will result in a nonlinear response and you will have to deal with overload recovery. Depending on the range of input currents you need to resolve, this might not be an issue. That being said, it is still important to consider the current source's range and the necessary output range beforehand. Knowing the two extreme solutions, will help recognize your application's allowable range of output voltages and select the most optimized feedback resistor. So far, we've been considering an ideal environment in which the input current only flows through one resistive component, the chosen feedback resistor. However, the transimpedance gain will vary in a practical environment. There will be additional impedances at the feedback network and at the inverting input at the amplifier. This can be unintentional, such as in the form of parasitic impedances caused by the traces, or deliberate, such as the impedance due to the inclusion of the feedback capacitor. These parasitic impedances can be considered negligible depending on the frequency of your application. Nonetheless, if achieving higher precision or gain accuracy is of importance for your design, it is beneficial to take into account these impedances when calculating for RF. As previously discussed, an optical sensor such as a photodiode introduces capacitance at the inverting input of the amplifier. The amount of capacitance will depend on the applied reverse voltage or reverse bias voltage. This value can usually be found in device's datasheet 
or it can be measured with test equipment by taking advantage of capacitor properties. The value of a diode capacitance typically falls between 1 picofarad to 1 nanofarad. In this case, the lower the value, the better, since diodes with higher capacitance exhibit slower input speeds, limiting the bandwidth and increasing the noise of the system. The last critical requirement to consider is determining the minimum bandwidth the system must achieve. This will depend on the characteristics of the input pulse and the desired output voltage. Let's start with the first equation shown here. It gives us a rise time relationship to closed loop bandwidth, which will provide the minimum amount of bandwidth the amplifier must be able to support. As a reminder, the equation was derived in TI Precision Lab video series on amplifier slew rate using the standard definition of rise time, the charging capacitor equation, and the cutoff frequency of the amplifier's closed loop bandwidth. The second equation shown here contributes additional information for narrowing down amplifier selection. Using the definition of slew rate, we can calculate the minimum value of slew rate needed that the amplifier will also have to support. We covered the basics of transimpedance applications and amplifiers. We also covered specifications that are important as the first step in choosing an amplifier. In the next video, we will cover stability concerns of a TIA introduced by the source input capacitance. Thank you for your time.